with another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Today's story, Cosmopolis. Hello there. This is another one of those stories of a town, the story of one of our harbor communities, and how it came to be and why. We've talked about a good many of them. We told you of Leo City and Chehalis that later became Westport. And we went over the story of Aberdeen. The other night we told you how Hoquiam came to be a city and we've talked about some of these those ghost towns like Grays Harbor City and Acosta. Now tonight we've opened our scrapbook to the story of a city that was among the very first on the harbor. And that has continued through all these years. It's still a city today. Not large, no, not what you might call a metropolis, but it continues to hold its own and it's very much on the map. It's the story of Cosmopolis. It was shortly after William O'Leary came to Grays Harbor. Remember him? The first white man to settle here in 1848. That a man named James Pilkington settled along the Chehalis River on the Tidewaters. James was one of two brothers who came to the valley before the Civil War and settled here. He was fussy where he built his split-shaped cabin, and he searched the river for some time before finally deciding on the spot where the river touched high ground above tidelands. It was the last bend in the river before it entered the harbor. This, figured James Pilkington, is a good place for a town, and he squatted there. He didn't know it, but he was building his campfire in historic grounds. For it was at this point where Governor Isaac Stevens met the Indians a couple of years before. The governor had a powwow on that spot to make a treaty with the Native Americans of the Chehala, Satsup, and Hump Tulips tribes. But that's another story, and we'll take that up some other evening when we're feeling very historical. Things, things were kind of rough to begin. There was a lot of unrest between the Native Americans and the new settler. But before long, a pair of pioneers who had joined the migration of 1853 into the upper Chehalis Valley near Grand Man began to look over the harbor as a possible place for the city. They were David F. Biles and Austin E. Young. Both were married and had families and were looking for a place to start a city. They had visions of great futures for the harbor and wanted to plot a town. And after they had cased the harbor, they settled at Cosmopolis. Sam James, the father of the clan that settled the area around James Rock and had a hand in pioneering of the Hoquiam area, gave them a name appropriate for their dream. He coined the name Cosmopolis meaning World City. And on the 25th of June, 1861, the town of Cosmopolis was filed on record by Young and Biles. Because it was the first recorded town in the Upper Harbor area, it became the center for what culture and civilization there was on the harbor. I think the world word would be culture. For a few months in the winter, school was taught. James Carr, that Hoquiam pioneer, paddled upriver in 1860 to teach the three R's to a handful of kiddies who were enrolled in school. James also started a brickyard with the settlers, and the red tailings of their dump may be seen today. But Cosmopolis was not yet ready for a settlement as a city. It was an unhappy place for a small group of pioneers. The families were in constant dread of an Indian uprising. When one of the little young children burned to death in a fire, the families packed their belongings on a barge and moved upriver to a new home. 
and Cosmopolis, except for an occasional trapper or hunter who made a summer camp there, was abandoned again. But again it came back. George Biles, a cousin to David Biles, and a man named George Lee moved into the house the first settlers had built. They were tanners and moved down from Tumwater. Of course, they thought first of business that they knew best and started a tannery. But hides were scarce and the distance to market was long. So after a few months, they left their spruce vats to decay and Cosmopolis went on, the, went on to the next industry. And the next industry was one that stuck and made possible the town that grew there. For the next venture was basically Gray's Harbor. It was a sawmill. Charles Stevens, who had settled on Stevens Prairie up in the Hump Tulips country, had built a grist mill at the mouth of the slough at Cosmopolis. With the help of N. W. Fletcher, he erected a two-story frame building with the intent of operating a grist mill. He put in a flume for water and installed a water well and began to grind wheat for flour. But the wheat, which was raised up country, had to be boated down, and when it had been processed, it had to be boated back again as flour, bran, gram, and shorts. The wheat was damp and the flour was poor, so it was a quick-lived venture, and the owner was ready to listen to Jason Fry, who had some idea about what the harbor really needed. It was a sawmill to turn some of their abundance of fine fur into lumber. Jason Fry sent his brother John, and the three men converted the ill-starred grist mill into a lumber mill with water power to operate the sash saw, and the pioneers began to call around at Cosmopolis for a scow load of boards for a new barn or floors for their houses. Two houses, the first built with sawn lumber, were immediately erected in Cosmopolis. One for Charles Fry out near the brick kiln and the other for Fred Carter across the street in the next block. You see, Cosmopolis was a town with lots and blocks. Well, the first load of lumber was soon stowed on board a ship, something that Harbor Sados folks have been doing ever since. It was of the little schooner Kate and Anne, skippered by Captain Lutjens, the fellow we mentioned the other evening in our story about Hope Moon. And things began to look up for the lumber business. But by the time the venture started to pay, Stevens was so far in debt to Esmond and Anderson of Montesano that he was obliged to let them take over the business. That was an uncommon happening in those early pioneers. A lot of them were gifted with the push and foresight to start a business and do amazing things but they lacked the business experience to make their venture pay off. So Esmond and Anderson went into the lumber business. They added an edger to the mill equipment and made other improvements, and within a year, they had the plant on a paying basis. In that, in that mill, they sawed the timbers for George Emerson's new Northwestern mill at Hopewim and A.J. West's mill at Aberdeen and a lot of pioneer homes were built with lumber cut on that sawmill run by the water wheel. But times were changing, and in 1884 when A.J. West began to install a steam boiler and engines to operate his mill, the Cosmopolis mill was also changed. They put in boilers and abandoned their flumes to Beaver Creek, the creek that runs along there by the high lines of the golf course today. Well. There was still no town there at Cosmopolis. The place had a name and a plot was registered, but it was little more than a sprinkling of huts along the river. But in 1883, Rule Nims brought out, bought out Biles and Young and began building and clearing. The store and the Riverside Hotel were the first structures to go up in a race with Sam Bend over in Aberdeen who was trying to get his town started ahead of Nims. And while Sam did exactly and didn't get and while Sam did not actually get a jump on Nims, there was boom enough for both of them. Nims had forty acres slashed and burned over. A schoolhouse was built and Eva 
Cosper hired as teacher for the five-month term. Nims filed his second plat of Cosmopolis in April of 1884. Well, it was 1885 before the boom got rolling. By that time, they were making lumber in Hopewim and Aberdeen, and the Cosmopolis mill had changed hands several times. Boats were putting in from Portland and San Francisco for lumber, and Grays Harbor was showing up on the map of the West. And of course, the principal city of the harbor was Cosmopolis, the first on the upper harbor cities to have a name. And then, through the boom of the 1890s, Cosmopolis gained in population, and when the railroad lines began to consider where to run their tracks, Cosmopolis had due consideration. In May 1892, the first train in the lower harbor backed into Cosmopolis. The frontier hamlet was by this time a rip-roaring community of 450 people. John Dasher was the train's engineer, and the engine was old 99. For a generation, a well-known toot at that whistle stop at the harbor. We're going to take a quick whistle stop right here for Dick Crombie and a word from our sponsor. If there was an industry associated with Cosmopolis that meant more than any others, it was the Grays Harbor Commercial Company. It was an outgrowth of the old water-powered sawmill and through the 1890s, it spread and sprawled. It added a tank plant and a box factory along with its cargo mill and operated a general merchandise store. The town went farther than that. It had its own newspaper, the Enterprise, and boasted a Western Union office, a long-distance telephone connection, and daily mail service. In 1908, the town was boasted a pair of single mills, shingle mills, daily train service, a high school, two electric light plants. Its population had risen to 1,300 people. A new railroad, the Grays Harbor and Puget Sound Line, had purchased the right-of-way and was considering building onto the city. It had two orchestras that furnished music for all festive occasions, Emil Bergen's Musicians, and Stephen Elder's Orchestra. But Cosmopolis was still growing. By 1915, it was a city of 1,800 people with four railroads. The big commercial company employed nearly 700 workers. Motion pictures had come to town, and it had a theater. In fact, it was a completely self-sufficient city with all the requirements of modern urban life. But fate had another phase of life in store for Cosmopolis. When the big commercial company stopped operations and depression grew across the land, the little town went downhill. The fire leveled much of the business district. Its institutions, except those supported by public contributions, departed one by one. Its high school students were transferred to Aberdeen, and the town lost some of its early day eminence. The automobile also brought Aberdeen Shopping District and the Southside Business District within reach, and many of the firms burnt out in the fire, never rebuilt and never restocked. And now what? Well, that's going to going a little far for us. We've talked about history, not prophecy, but it could could it be far wrong to assume that the little town is in for many more changes before history stops dealing with Cosmopolis. And the town that Sam James named World City may come a lot closer than we think to being just that some generations from now. But if it never justifies its name, it still justifies a good page in this, our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. <laughs>